Today in World Literature, we turn to student presentations. The first group of students have worked together throughout the semester as the North American Study Group. They present a collaborative report on Toni Morrison's Beloved. In the report, the students analyze the novel as the embodiment of a story that transcends cultures. To demonstrate the richness of the novel, Beloved is treated both as an historical document and a fictional narrative. The students then compare the novel to Garcia Marquez's Love in the Time of Cholera, Langston Hughes's The Negro Speaks of Rivers, and August Wilson's Joe Turner's Come and Gone. As George Alacron, a student, reminds us in his closing analysis, literature provides the reader with a precious gift. The gift is the continuity of human experience. Literature, our student tells us, reminds us that we are not alone. Um, good evening. We're the North American group. Um, our topic tonight is Beloved History or Fiction, presented by myself, David Neichel, Bob Pasture, and George Alicon. Um, John, one of our other presenters, couldn't be here tonight. Um, just to start off, I'd like to go with a brief problem statement. What we're going to attempt to do is show the parallels between the fiction of Beloved and the historical references to demonstrate that the, his, the story itself transcends other cultures and countries and it's not just a North American phenomena. We'll refer to different incidents, themes, and characters from the stories that we've read um, just to make our comparisons with Beloved. As a general overview, our brief introduction, we'll go through the origins and descriptions of slavery in America, We'll look at Beloved in a chronological point of view as history itself compared to the novel. We'll take a look at Beloved as fiction with a comparison and themes to Love in the Time of Cholera. And then we'll wind up with our conclusion and we're excited. And now Bob will take us briefly into um, a brief history of slavery and some of the factual concepts of it. Bob? This part of the presentation will provide a historical background of slavery in North and South America to help understand the context in which Beloved was written. Slavery, the facts. An estimated 80% of the slaves that were brought to the Americas were captives taken in tribal wars between the Africans and sold to white slave traders. The white slave traders included the Portuguese, French, English, Dutch, and Spaniards. Most of the slaves that were brought to the North and South America originated from the area of Africa, from Senegal to Angola. That's this portion over here of southeastern Africa. An estimated total of 10 to 12 million slaves were brought to the Americas, with about 95% going to the Caribbean and Latin America. The greatest share of the slaves went to Portugal's Brazil, where the largest African-American population exists today outside of the continent of Africa, about 70 million people. This map shows the progression of slaves being brought into the North and South America. There were about a half a million brought into the United States, about four to five million brought into the Caribbean, and about five million brought into South America through Brazil. The mortality rate of shipborne slaves was about 25 percent in the 17th and early 18th century, declining to 15 percent after 1730 to 10% by the 19th century. One ship surgeon observed that the traders wedged them, the slaves in, so that they had not so much room as a man in his coffin, either in length or breadth. It was impossible for them to turn or shift with any degree of ease. This drawing just shows the slaves, how they were packed into the hull of a ship. Um, it's kind of hard to see the detail, but that's basically people on the bottom. From 1800 to 1860, the slave population in North America grew from 1 million to 4 million as the slave owners encouraged breeding to keep pace with the labor demands of cotton production. The dark areas of this map shows cotton production in 1820, and the darker areas here show the increase in 1860, commensurate with the rise in the slave population up to 4 million by 1860. Runaway slaves shows routes north to the free states, including Ohio and even Canada, and to a lesser extent Mexico, and the Caribbean, utilizing the Underground Railroad and other means of escape. And this just shows the escape routes of the slaves from the slave states to the northern free states, Canada, and Mexico. And now Dave will present a chronological history.
just as a brief chronology as compared to the novel Beloved, um, predecessing Beloved in the time period, you have 1619 with the slaves first entering the English colonies, and then we have different periods of where we have 1760, the Quaker abolitionist, abolitionist movement, 1793, which the first fugitive slave law was passed, and 1830, where the term Underground Railroad first came into usage. Um, this comes into play into the novel Beloved, to where Toni Morrison references 1848 when Setha first arrives at Sweet Home, 1850 where the tougher fugitive slave law is passed itself, and then 1855 we have Setha leaving Sweet Home via the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is significant to the point that 1855 the school teacher arrives at 124 to bring um, Setha and her kids back. Uh, this is actually probably one of the turning points in the novel because this is where Setha kills her child and Beloved sort of transcends to the gothic sense. Um, this is also referenced where Toni Morrison first wrote about the novel. She used an actual person by the name of Margaret Garner who killed two of her own children trying to escape slavery and that's one of the basis of the novel itself. Um, 1863, we have the Emancipation Proclamation issued, freeing all the slaves in the Confederate States. And 1865, we have the 13th Amendment allowing, um, of the Constitution passed outlawing slavery in the entire country. Uh, 1873 is when Beloved first arrives in her mythical form at 124 Bluestone, which is where the story pretty much um, pretty much takes into effect and really gets going. And then in, in a short period of time of two years, Beloved vanishes and Paul D. returns to where we, we pretty much think we have a happy ending. Um, now I'm going to turn the floor over to George to where he's going to compare the theme of um, Beloved to some certain theme aspects in Love in the Time of Cholera. <coughs> Uh, literature provides the reader with a precious gift. Uh, this gift is the learning of continuity of human experience. Literature, because, literature assures us that we are not alone in this world. Because of that, uh, because of our, our experience, our uh, uh, enjoy that, that we have enjoyed as a as a as a society, and they parallel um, other cultures, other societies, with equal experiences. In this context, the priceless uh, proof of continuity of human experience can be compared to two works of literature. One, the first one from uh, South America. Uh, by, Ma by Garcia Marquez, the love in this time of the time of cholera, and the second one from North America by Toni Morrison, the story of Beloved. On the one hand, <coughs> Beloved is the story about uh, a slavery, but it's also about family, history, and love. On the other hand, uh, the story of uh, love in the time of cholera is about a, it's a romantic story, it's a saga, a, a, a cataclysmic, cataclysmic uh, uh, love story. Even though the two stories are uh, different, the theme of love in both stories, uh, passionate love, um, elderly love, and destructive love can be picked up at many points in each of these stories. As a, for instance, in uh, Beloved, uh, Seda is compelled her, her immense love for the children 
compels her to kill, to kill his her little daughter. Uh, beloved, uh, as a young woman, uh, her 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 love for for Seda, her mother and Denver, her sister, becomes also a destructive force when she attempts to kill both by starving them to death. Similarly, in um, love of the time of cholera, we we, we learn about uh, American Bikuna suicide because of the love of Florentino. Florentino Arisa himself uh, was at the point of destruction when, uh, for, because of uh, Fermina's uh, refusal uh, of, her, of, of, of his love, and uh, she terminated uh, their love affair. <coughs> Elderly love is also a special element in these two stories. Uh, in beloved Paul D. and Seda, after 25 years uh, of their tumultuous uh, uh, past as uh, as uh, formerly a, sl a slave a slave people, uh, they join their uh, passion in a happy union. In love, in the time of cholera, Florentino and Fermina, at the age of 75. Finally, and after uh, half a century, they got together and consumed their passion, love, and embraced what was left of their lives. In closing, it is worthy to point out that uh, both of the authors have established a common ground in, this, in these two stories. They are ending, uh, in ending their rest their, their respective respective stories, because it, it is not uh, the cruelties of uh, the slavery of uh, evils of the slavery or the cholera for that matter, but they chose uh, love, elderly love. Uh, and now I uh, turn it over to to Dave for the conclusion. So in, just in conclusion, I hope we can just touch on a couple topics that we hope we've reached. Um, I hope we prove that the theme of the story of Beloved is cross-cultured and can meet different aspects of different authors, different genres and themes. Um, the story crosses many different genres. In um, an example of a poem we read, The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes, which depicts the story of slavery throughout history. Um, it's just a topic of, of slavery that some authors use. We've also read plays such as Joe Turner's Come and Gone by August Wilson, and as George had mentioned, um, the fiction of Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, we believe that in order to truly interpret Beloved and, and really understand the novel, you have to have a brief sense of the history of, of slavery itself. Um, to appreciate the fiction and, and the novel as a whole. Um, and what I'd like to do now is just go through our work cited list, just as some of the, the references that we've used. A um, little short thing by William Dudley, Slavery Opposing Viewpoints, Liberty Line, The Legend of the Underground Railroad by Larry Gara, um, Love in the Time of Cholera, of course, by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Tony Morrison's Beloved. We've used um, National Geographic Society's references, history of the Atlas of the U.S. for some of our maps that we've used. Uh, we've also used a great geographical atlas, um, cliff notes on Morrison's Beloved, and some topics from encyclopedias, such as slavery from Encyclopedia Britannica. We've also used uh, slavery from the World Book Encyclopedia, and the slave trade article in National Geographic magazine. Uh, thank you very much.
We continue our student presentations with a report from the study group on Latin America and the Caribbean. These students examine the role that the search for identity plays in this contemporary literature. After beginning with a brief history of Latin American literature, the students stress that readers must come to an understanding that social and political problems are incorporated into literature. That is, as Norman A. Spencer of Nassau Community Colleges has written, for many writers of Argentina, Cuba, Guatemala, Peru, Colombia, Guiana, Mexico, Cuba, Brazil, and Chile, freedom of the imagination is a creative weapon against confining bureaucracy and brutal injustice that characterizes their societies. To prove that the political and the artistic are intertwined in the Latin American artistic experience, the students turn to Pablo Neruda's The United Fruit Company, Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, and Emile Cesar's Out of Alien Days. Special attention is also given to the role of women in Latin American literature, and an analysis is made of Isabel Allende's Phantom Palace. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We are the members of the Latin American Study Group. Our names are Marina Cubillas, uh, Jason Clestesos, uh, Samuel Mena, and myself, Antonio Pasquale. Our discussion will regard the struggle for identity in, uh, in Latin American literature. We will examine the role of Latin American literature in the search for identity. Our presentation will touch the following points. Uh, social political history, history of contemporary literature, identity and independence in Martinique through the work of Aimé Césaire, uh, the role of females in Latin American literature, and finally, conclusion. Uh, starting uh, from the history, uh, uh, starting from the history, we have um, in 1492, we have the discovery of the continent, and then uh, in the early 1500s, between 1500 and 1530, we have the Spanish and Portuguese invasion of the continent, and then uh, uh, Latin America rem remained most of the time a, a Spanish and Portuguese <coughs> dominion until the early 1800s, in which uh, the movement for democracy before uh, independence starts. And then, uh, while all the countries uh, around 1830 reached the independence, they were like uh, very, they, all the countries were um, politically unstable, and uh, most of the government were totalitarian and militaristic. Anyway, uh, at the mid of the 1900, we had, um, uh, again, some attempt of democracy and and then uh, finally, in the 70s, we had a big economic collapse, and uh, most of the country turned back to militaristic and totalitarian regimes. Now, uh, nowadays, we see that there is a slow return to civilian uh, government and democracy. So now I'll introduce you to um, Samuel, that will speak about uh, contemporary South American literature. Latin American literature in the last half of the century has become more universal and in its themes and symbols. Social and political problems are common issues used by contemporary writers. Folklore, alienation, solitude, despair, evil, love, hate, humor, philosophy, and psychology have been incorporated. Myth and fantasy have also been used to develop their own literary style called magical realism. The leader of the, contem of the contemporary Latin American literature are on the map. I want to start with the Guatemalan Miguel Angel Asturias Nobel Prize in 1967. The next one, the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, Nobel Prize 1971. 
Gabriel García Marquez from Colombia, Nobel Prize 1982. And finally, Octavio Paz from Mexico, Nobel Prize in 1990. Those writers have some in common. They always told about the political and the struggle about Latin American community. The common sense is the United Fruit Company in Latin America. The United Fruit Company was primarily a United States corporation that establishes in Latin American countries. Therefore, with the settlement of this corporation, began the era of neocolonialism domination by the United States, initiating the struggle against it in most Latin American countries. Garcia Marquez, in his book, 100 Years of Solitude, and in the history of Big Mama Funeral, wrote about the social and political problems created by this company in Colombia. Paulo Neruda, speak about the same reality in Chile in his book, General Son, a collection of 340 poems. Miguel Angel Asturias in Guatemala does the same thing in his novel, The President. Otavio Paz made a strong criticism about injustice in Mexico in his essay, Labyrinth of Solitude. Latin American contemporary writers are speaking about the same evil. The evil is abusing and creating social and political injustice in their land with the complicity of corrupt government and foreign country support. Contemporary Latin American boys want to see their land free itself from the empire that suck her, from the castes that exploit her, from the force that today offends and repress her. Today, Latin American literature is beginning to be discovered and accepted worldwide for the international opinions. Contemporary writers as civilized has allowed them to showcase both the phenomenal quality of Latin American writing and the wonders of Latin American reality. Thank you. Now, Jason will speak about the Caribbean opinion. Uh, I'm going to speak on the Caribbean aspect of this. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the identity through independence, where I'll be going through the Caribbean Isle of Martinique through one of their authors, Emi Cesar, and Cesar's poem, Out of Alien Days. <clears throat> the Caribbean writers express the struggle of finding identity. One example of this is shown on the small island of Martinique, located right north of South America, right there at Small Island. These people are searching for an identity that they as a whole never had. Martinique has been under French control for a major part of their known existence. These people feel that independence from France will give them their identity that they have longed for. One man who fought this freedom is Ami Cesar. He influenced most of the post-war politics of Martinique and was the founder of the Negative Movement, a movement in his words that would restore the culture, identity, and dignity of blacks from his homeland. After resigning from the Communist Party in 56, he formed his own party, the Progressive Party of Martinique. He won the Martinique elections in 1957 and it seemed independence would be achieved. In his poem, Out of Alien Days, which is in our text, he speaks of the searching for an identity that has been taken from him and his people. He begins his poem by speaking of Martinique as one day being free and how they could live the way they have always wished. The next stanza, he says to his people that they are just mere toys to the larger power of France and have no real worth to them. He then goes on to speak how change must begin starting tomorrow so that one day they can be free and can end the sleepless nights of insecurity. Cesar fights and prays that someday his people will achieve this independence, and they too, as stated in the poem, will sprout ahead of their own and will eventually be out of alien days. 
Now we go to Marina, who's going to speak on women in uh, Latin American literature. The search for identity is also portrayed in the roles of women in Latin American literature, as I will demonstrate in the following pieces. In the story Sunday, Sunday by Marvi Vargas Llosa, the character of Flora has no meaning within the story. She's only used by the author to depict the relationship between Miguel and Ruben. She's an object of competition among them. In The Intruder by Jorge Luis Borges, Juliana Burgos is a possession of the Nielsen brothers. When she threatens their relationship, they resolve this conflict by killing her. The question here is who owns whom? Do the Nielsen brothers own Juliana Burgos as Spain owns Latin America? Is it right for them to have killed her as the Spanish killed the indigenous culture in Latin America? Both these stories have an element of machismo and they both have allegorical meaning if we depict the woman as Latin America and the men, the possessors, as Spain. The next story, Phantom Palace by Isabel Allende, there is a change of roles because the Latin American men, El Benefactor, owns Marshall Lieberman, a North American woman. Eventually, Marsha Lieberman finds her identity among the Indians in the palace because just as the Indians were captured by the Europeans, she was captured by El Benefactor. They both share a similar fate. In Obsidian Butterfly by Octavio Paz, the portrayal of the Indian goddess is it's a papalotle gives meaning to the indigenous culture. But this culture has passed on, and the image of the Indian goddess is incorporated into the version of Guadalupe by the new generation of the Mexican culture. The meaning of the culture and its identity is held down to through this new image. Finally, in Love in the Time of Cholera, a novel by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Fermina Daza searches for her identity. She has always been subject to her husband, Juvenal Urbino's life. And when he dies, she's able to live her own life. After 50 years, her rekindled love affair with Florentino Ariza becomes a liberation for her. So her search for identity is also a search for love and happiness despite the ravages of time and the threat of death. As I demonstrated through this piece, sometimes there's a resolution to the search for identity, but unfortunately, there isn't always one. Just as it has happened throughout the history of Latin America, where even till now, the culture still searches for a true identity. Pass it on to Tony for a conclusion. Okay. As a conclusion, uh, since we all know that the situation in South America is not still is still not settled, we can we can decide, we can point out the reason that uh, drive to this um, search for identity. We can uh, we can mention the humiliation and the annihilation of the indigenous societies. Slavery is without no doubt uh, reason. And then we can mention the displacement of all the immigrants that they went uh, all over the Americas. We can mention the confluence and collision of different cultures. And finally, you know, in our days, there is the lack of freedom and democracy. Thank you. Uh, this is the, the list of uh, work uh, that we used. We have uh, Not Vicious Circle, uh, 20 Pond of Amnesty's Eyes uh, by Davis Gregson. We have the, our anthology, Limbs and Spencer, uh, One Word of Literature. We have uh, Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Mar Garcia Marquez. We have uh, uh, Garcia Marquez by George McMurray. And uh, um, some elements from the New Encyclopedia Britannica. Thank you very much. In both presentations, we have seen that students engage literature in meaningful ways. Our students clearly have not sought the easiest things to say. Rather, they have designed complex topics that take them across authors and nations to strengthen their arguments. Certainly, the excellent and perceptive work of these students reveals that the study of contemporary world literature is especially relevant to students living in a global culture.